Konnichiwa. In this tutorial you will learn everything you need to know about SEO, search engine optimization in Next.js. We will learn how to properly prepare our website for Google's search crawlers, by setting static and dynamic metadata for each page, by creating a sitemap and a robots.txt file, and by configuring the cache for each page properly so that our pages load as fast as possible, which is an important ranking factor on search engines. We will also learn about some other little tips and strategies when it comes to SEO and in the end I will show you how you can connect your website to the Google Search Console and the Zell Analytics. To follow along you should already know the basics of Next.js and the App Router. I have a full tutorial on that here on YouTube. I will put a link to it into the top right corner. If you are new to Next.js just watch this tutorial first and then you can come back here. Now a few of the things I cover in this tutorial are already covered in this beginner tutorial but I need to cover them here as well because they are important for SEO. To follow along with this tutorial I already prepared a little starting project. It's a very simple blog that just has some different posts. So each of these lines here is a title of a post. When we click it we get to the page of the post. Now I put an artificial loading time in here so this takes a second to load. This is on purpose because later we will learn how to render and cache our pages in advance so that we completely skip this loading time in production. The data for this blog is coming from dummyjson.com. It's just a REST API with some dummy data so that we can make a fetch request here and get some posts that we can show on our website. You can download the starting code from GitHub. I will put a link to the repository into the video description. Just clone this repository, open it in VS Code, then run npm install in the command line to install the packages. And then as usual you can just npm run dev to start this project in development mode and then you should see the same block as me. Again, the link to the repository is in the video description. Please also subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet for more Next.js content and please also leave a like on this video if you like it. And then I wish you a lot of fun with this tutorial. Okay, and now we will step by step improve our starting project to make it more optimized for search engines. The first step is to set the metadata for all our pages because this is what actually shows up in the Google search results. So the page titles, the page descriptions and also the fav icon and so on. Let's start with the fav icon. When we create a new Next.js project we already have such a fav icon.ico file with the Bazel logo. This shows up in the tab of the browser but also for example in the Google search results. So you usually want this to be your own logo or some kind of icon that represents your website. There are different free generators online to create these fav icon files. I usually use this one here. I don't have any affiliation with them but this one just works. So here on realfavicongenerator.net or just type fav icon generator into Google we click on this generate button and then I want to go into our project because I already prepared a logo that we can use in the starting code in the SRZ folder and then inside assets there is this logo I created for the website. This is just a normal PNG file. We can select this and create a fav icon out of it. We get a preview how this will look. We can do some additional configuration like setting a background color but we don't need any of this. I just want to go all the way down and click on generate your fav icons. Then we wait until this has finished and then we can ignore most of the stuff. We just want to download the fav icon package. We open the folder where we saved it in and in the zip file there are a bunch of different files. But we actually only care about the fav icon. These other ones are for example if you want to turn your website into an app and put it into the App Store or Google Play Store. Then there are variations of our logo for these stores as well. But we don't care about them. We only need this fav icon ICO file. So we copy this file and go into our project folder again. SRZ app where already there is the old fav icon. We delete this one and paste the new one in here. Now it still shows the old icon but I think this is just a caching problem. Let's open this file. Yeah. And as we can see it's actually the correct new fav icon. 
zu, I guess, Windows just caches these image previews and shows the wrong one. And the fav icon has to be placed directly inside the app folder. This is how it works in Next.js. You don't have to set your own meta tag in the head of the website like you do it in raw HTML. Instead, Next.js takes care of this for you. But this only works if you put the fav icon directly into the app folder. This is where Next.js expects this file. And it also has to have this exact name, favicon.ico. We can close the fav icon generator and if you refresh the page, you should see your new fav icon in the top left corner. Sometimes this doesn't work right away. You can try pressing Ctrl F5 to bust the cache and reload the page. But as long as the correct fav icon here is shown in the project, this will be set correctly and it will work in production. Next, I want to set the open graph image. That's the image that's shown when you paste a link to your website on social media, Twitter for example or Facebook, then you can add such a preview image that will be shown together with the link. It's recommended for this image to have a width of 1200 pixels and a height of 630 pixels. But this is just a normal PNG file and you can create this file with any image editing tool. I like to use Jim for that. It's a completely free alternative to a Photoshop. It's really powerful, but you could also use Microsoft Paint, for example, if you want. I will put a link to this OG image into the video description as well. You can download it from here. And again, we have to follow a certain naming and folder convention for this to work. So the file has to be called opengraph-image in order for Next.js to detect it. And again, we want to put this directly into the app folder. So we open the app folder where our fav icon is already in. And we take this open graph image and paste it in here. And then this will just work. Again, under the hood, Next.js set some tag in the head of the page. We will later take a look at this. But this is all abstracted away for us to make this process simpler. This open graph image will now be used for our whole website for all pages. Later, we will also learn how we can set specific OG images for specific pages. And we can also change these OG images dynamically. For example, to use the thumbnail of a blog post as the OG image for this page. But more on that later. Then we go into the root layout.tsx file. As we learned in the Next.js beginner tutorial, this root layout wraps our whole application. And this is the best place to set base metadata for our website. So this is the metadata that will be used if we don't set more specific metadata on other pages. We do this by exporting a const called metadata with this exact spelling. And we set a type to metadata, which is a next import because this way we get auto-completion in here. Again, this is an abstraction provided by Next.js. Under the hood, this generates specific tags in the head tag of the website. We will take a look at this in a moment. And for all of these different tags, there are options available in here, but we don't need all of them. Important is of course the title of the website because this will be shown in Google and also here on our browser tab. So this is set to a create next app by default. Now we can change the string in here, but we can actually also pass an object with curly braces. And then we get some more granular control. So for example, we can set the default to a string. I'm going to write my awesome blog because this is the title of this website. This default will be used when we don't set a more specific title on another page. This has the same effect as just passing this string to the title directly. But with this object, what we can also do is we can define a template, which is a really cool feature because this way we can interpolate our default string with a more specific page title. For example, I want the root URL to say my awesome blog. But when I open a blog post, I want to have the title of the blog post and then a dash and then my awesome block behind it. And instead of repeating this pattern for every single page, we can use such a template string. So we write dollar sign $s. This is where the title of the child page will be put in. And then here I write dash and again my awesome block or whatever you want. So this part here is completely up to you. 
And then later this part here will be replaced with the title of the child page. We will see this in a moment. Let's also change the description of the website. This one is not shown in the browser, but this is shown for example when we post a link to our website on social media. So this is a really important piece. I'm gonna change this to a come and read my awesome articles. Write whatever you want. A lot of other meta tags are automatically inferred from these tags here. For example, there is a Twitter description tag where we can set a specific description just for Twitter. But if we don't define one, then the default description of our page will be used for Twitter. The same for example with the open graph image, which will automatically be used on Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn and so on. If you want to set more specific metadata, just use autocomplete and somewhere in here should be what you're looking for. For example, we have this Twitter option, which expects an object. And here, as I already described, you can set a more specific description, but we don't need this. But one value I usually set in here is card. And I set this to summary large image. This defines how our open graph image will be shown on Twitter, because it can be shown as a small image or as a large image. We want to show the large image, which just looks better. In a minute, I will show you how you can check how the social media previews for your website will look without having to deploy your project first. But before we do that, I also want to set the metadata for some other pages. Next, let's open the page.tsx file in the about folder. This is the about page and there is a link to this page here in the footer. As I explained, this uses the default title that we set in our layout TSX. So this is the fallback basically, but we can set a more specific title for this page. For this, we go above the component and again, we export const metadata, make sure the spelling is correct with the same casing, that's important. And we set the type to metadata from next. And now we can set the same values in here, for example, the page title. I want to set this to about. And as you can see, this title is now put into our template string here. And it looks like this, about dash my awesome blog. This way we don't have to repeat dash my awesome blog on every single page. It's just more convenient. Now on some pages, you might want to not have this dash my awesome blog and overwrite the title completely. You can do this as well by again passing an object here and using absolute instead. When I set this to about, the rest of the template disappears, but we can still keep it in our root layout, which is really useful. But I don't want this here. I want my template. And then let's copy this into the privacy page as well, here at the top, again outside of the component, change this to a privacy policy, and we have to import the metadata type. And this is this privacy policy page which I prepared. And as I already explained, Next.js automatically creates certain meta tags in the head of the website, and we can see them by opening the Chrome DevTools, you do this with F12. Then we go into the Elements tab. Here we can expand Head. And here we can find all the meta tags generated for this page. For example, here is the description tag with the description we set up in our code. Our Twitter card setting, Twitter title is generated automatically. It's all in here. And somewhere in here is also our open graph image. That's this one. And this points to our open graph image file. Now there are certain websites we can use to check our social media previews, like socialsharepreview.com. The problem is, of course, our website is running on localhost. It's not actually on the internet, so we can't paste a link there. So we either have to deploy our project to check this, or we can use something like sre.us, which is a way to run your localhost website on the internet just temporarily for testing purposes. There are also other tools that can do the same, but what I like about this one is that we don't have to sign up for anything, we don't have to install anything, we just need to copy this command and run this in the command line. 
you might have to set up SSH first for this to work. But if you can't get this to work, this is also not a problem. You don't need to follow this step. I just want to show you the previews of our website, but you can skip this step if you want. So this is my temporary URL here. I can copy this, open it on the internet, and there is my awesome blog. And this is actually running on the internet with an HTTPS connection. Isn't this cool? And we didn't have to install anything. And now we can take this URL and put it into this social share preview checker. Now, sometimes this tool hangs for some reason, it doesn't load the OG image. There's also another similar tool called opengraph.xyz. Here I pasted the same URL and here we can see our preview with the page title, the description below and the OG image. Let's try slash privacy, which shows the same OG image and description because this is the fallback data that we set in the root layout, but we see our page specific title. Nice. Later we will learn how we can set this metadata more dynamically from the data of the page itself. For example, you might want to use the title of the blog post as the page title or the thumbnail of the blog post as the OG image. You can do this as well. More on that in a moment. For now we close this. And I want to quickly talk about a few other things. In the root layout, a new Next.js project automatically uses this Google font imported from next slash font slash Google. This is actually pretty useful for SEO because these fonts are locally hosted on our own server, on our own website. Whereas many other websites load Google fonts from the Google servers directly. However, this is actually bad for user privacy and in the EU it's actually kind of illegal because when you load a font from Google, the IP address of your website's visitor is actually sent to Google servers and this is illegal without the user's permission because the IP address is considered personal data and you can't just send this around willy nilly. However, we avoid this problem by using these local fonts because again, they are stored on our own server and they also load faster, which is great for SEO because we don't need this connection to Google. This is why you should prefer them. And whenever you use images somewhere in your Next.js app, you should use the next image if possible. This is this uppercase I image and it's an import from next slash image. The biggest benefit of these next images is that Next.js automatically resizes them to the size in which they are actually shown on the screen. So even if the image file is 2000 pixels big, but you only show it with 100 pixels width and height, then Next.js automatically resizes this image file for you if you use this image component, which is very important for loading speed, which again is important for SEO. We don't have any images in our practice project here, but we use many different images in my other Next.js project tutorials. You can find them here on my channel. I'm gonna remove this image here because we don't need it. And then let's continue with dynamic metadata. Often this static metadata is not enough because we can only hard code strings and images in here. But we can't change this dynamically. For example, I don't want to show the exact same title for every blog post. Instead, I want to show the title of the blog post in the page title. So let's open the blog post page. We can find this under post ID slash page.tsx here in this folder. Again, we go above the component. But instead of exporting const metadata, we export an async function called generate metadata. And again, make sure the spelling is correct with an uppercase M and all the other letters in lowercase. Again, this function will return metadata, but since it's an async function, we have to wrap the return type into a promise. So this returns a promise of type metadata. Again, by setting the type of the function explicitly, we get all the completion in the return block. For example, our good old title and description. In the page component itself down here, we fetch the blog post from the API and then show it in the layout. We need the same data, the same blog post also in here to generate our metadata. 
but we can actually not share data between these two functions. Instead, the way this works in the Next.js app router is that we have to fetch the same data and generate metadata again. And for this, we get the same URL param that we also receive in the component. This URL param is the post ID. I explain this in my Next.js beginner tutorial. It's this path up here in the URL that's different between different blog posts. When I change this to four, we open a different blog post. That's this post ID. And we use this ID to fetch the blog post from the API. And the generate metadata function can receive the same arguments as the page component itself. So we copy this whole part here and paste it up here. And now we can fetch the same blog post with the same post ID in generate metadata. And this will be executed before the page is rendered. And then we want to fetch the same data. So we copy these two lines above the return statement and generate metadata. I don't want to destructure the post here, so I change this to a post. And then we can simply use the post data to generate our metadata. For example, we can set the page title to post.title. We can set the description to the body of the post, for example, or a summary. What exactly you put in here is up to you. And our blog posts don't have any featured images, but if they had, we could also set the OG image, the open graph image of each blog post dynamically. We can do this by adding this open graph value, which receives an object. In here we have images, which receives an array, so square brackets. And in here we can put an object that expects the URL key. And this could, for example, point to a post.image URL. Now again, our blog posts don't have an image URL, so this will not work. But let's imagine we had a thumbnail for our blog post, then this image would be used as the OG image for this page, and it would overwrite the open graph image PNG file. But since we don't have this value, I will comment this out and just leave it in here as a reminder. And when we save this, we will already see the title of the blog post here in our tab, together with our dash my awesome blog template. Cool. But there are a few things I want to clarify. First of all, you might be wondering, isn't it wasteful to fetch the same data twice in the page component and in the generate metadata function? Especially if we render this page dynamically every time the user opens the page without caching it, then we would make two requests to the same endpoint to render one page. However, Next.js actually automatically deduplicates fetch requests. So when we make a fetch request to the same URL, it doesn't matter in how many places we do this request, it will only be executed one time when the page is rendered. So since these two fetch requests have the same URL, there will only be one fetch request executed and the data will automatically be shared between these two functions. And Next.js does this automatically, but only if we use fetch. If you use an ORM like Prisma, for example, or if you use Axios instead of fetch, then this automatic deduplication does not happen. Then you have to do it yourself. And this works the following way. You create a separate function. You can put it in here or into a separate file, depending where you need it. We store this function in a variable called, for example, get post. The name is up to you. And then we have to call a function called cache, but autocomplete doesn't work right now. So I import this manually. This is an import from React. So this cache function belongs to React itself. It's not part of Next.js or a library, it's part of core React. And this cache function does the same thing I just explained. It deduplicates these requests so that they will only be executed once within the render cycle. To this cache function, you have to pass the function that you want to cache. So for example, we could put an async function in here that expects the post idea. We make this an error function. And in here, let's say we retrieve our post from Prisma. Now I'm not using Prisma in this project, so I will comment out this code in a moment. I just want to show you how this would work. So for example, prisma.post.findUnique, to which we pass the post ID. Then we would return the post from this function. 
And then uh, when we fetch the post, we would call await get post here and also down in our component. And again, this way we deduplicate these requests so that they are only executed once. But again, this is not necessary if you use the native fetch function. So again, I will comment this out. Just leave it here as a reminder. I have a bunch of different tutorials where we use Prisma and there you can see again how to do this exactly. I will just leave an explainer comment here. Manually deduplicate requests if not using fetch. So you can take a look at the code later and remember what this was for. It's also important to note that you can only export this generate metadata function and also static metadata from a server component. You can't export this from a client component. So if you need interactivity on this page, if you need JavaScript features like onclick listeners here, then you can't make this component a client component because then this part here will not work anymore. Instead, you have to extract the page content into a client component. So let's say, for example, we want this whole page to be a client component for some reason, because we need a lot of JavaScript here. Then we could cut out this part, create a new file called, for example, blog post page, make it a client component, paste the code that we just cut out, and then we render this blog post page component, this client component here in our server component. This way we can use client component features in here, but we can still export our metadata. Okay, but I don't need client component features here, so I reword this. Instead of setting a specific OG image here in this metadata return value, we could also put another open graph minus image.png file into this folder. And again, it would replace the one in the root folder, but just for this page. But usually you want to set a dynamic OG image depending on the post data and this is how you do it. However, there is one more cool alternative. We can also generate an OG image from a TSX file, so a component. This is how it looks. You can see the instructions in the documentation. You can put diffs and styling in here and you can generate an OG image dynamically. And again, you can also fetch data in here, like the blog post. Now this is beyond the scope of this tutorial, but I can show you an example of this from my personal blog. There I use these open graph image TSX files. So for example, here I have this blog post and this is the featured image, right? And the title of the post is five AI tools I can't live without as a developer. When I copy this URL and paste it on socialsharepreview.com, this is how it looks. So the page title is put on top of the OG image with this dark background to make the text more readable. And this is especially useful on X or formerly Twitter because they don't show the page title in the preview anymore. They only show the image and the URL and there it's really useful to have the title layered on top of the image. Again, how exactly you do this is described in the Next.js documentation. If you want a detailed tutorial on this, let me know in the comments below. Okay, this is all about metadata. Next, we will take care of caching our pages properly so that we get rid of this loading time because a long loading time is terrible for SEO. Okay, the easiest way to find out how our pages are cached is to just build the project. For this, we stop the execution of our development server. And then we type in npm run build instead of run dev. We execute this. This takes a few seconds depending on the size of the project and what kind of potato machine you're running it on. But after it's done, we get this output and we have a list of our different pages and these little icons to the left of them. As you can see down here, these icons tell us how each page is rendered and cached. Now, whenever possible, Next.js automatically caches a page. So it's rendered when we compile the project. And every time a visitor opens this page, they get sent the ready-made HTML and we don't have to wait for anything to load anymore. And we can see this effect on the front page. But first we have to execute npm run start to run the project we just built, then refresh the page. And on the front page, I also have this one second delay 
But when we build the project, Next.js renders this whole page, it fetches the data, it generates the HTML, and whenever we then open this page, we get just sent the HTML, and we don't execute this part here again, including the delay. This is only executed at compile time. And this is why we don't have our loading time anymore. I can refresh the page as often as I want, we don't get this one second delay anymore. And if it was 10 seconds, we wouldn't have this delay either. This page loads instantly. This is one of the big strengths of Next.js. It caches these pages for you, so they open as fast as possible. But when we open a single blog post, we still have our loading time of one second. Why? Because we have a dynamic URL parameter here right at the moment we are on post 4 but we can also go to a post 20 which has different data the problem is next.js doesn't know in advance what different values we can put in here this is why the data for this page has to be fetched when we actually open the page so this code here will not be executed at compile time it will be executed when someone visits the page including the one second delay and all the loading time. And when we take a look into the console again, we can also see that this has this lambda icon here, which means this page is dynamically rendered. Whenever possible, we want to avoid dynamic rendering. We can't always avoid it. Sometimes we need dynamic data when the page is opened, but statically cached pages are much faster to load. So they are also better for SEO. Again, the problem is that Next.js can't know in advance what different post IDs we can put into this URL, so it can't render these pages at compile time. However, we can tell Next.js what values we can put into the post ID, and then static caching will work even for our blog posts. For this we have to implement another function, and again I already covered this in my Next.js beginner tutorial, but for completion I also want to cover it here. So somewhere in the same file, outside of the component, we export another async function called generate static params. Again, it's important that the spelling is correct. And from this function, we want to return an array that contains all the different post IDs that we want to render in advance. So how do we get these post IDs? Well, we need to fetch all our posts, the same as we did on the front page, right? So we copy this part and the second line as well, paste it in generate static params, also import this type here from the models folder, and again this fetch request will automatically be deduplicated with this one here, but it would also not really matter if we execute this twice, because this will only run at compile time, one single time, so it's not a big deal to uh, execute one more request. So now we have each post, and now we want to turn this into an array of post IDs. So we return post.map, parentheses, another pair of parentheses, and then a pair of curly braces, because this way we can destructure this post object in this map call. And in here is the ID of each post. Then here between these two closing parentheses, we make a right arrow and right ID. This way we map the ID of the post into an array of IDs, which we return from this function. So this array will look something like this. One for post one, two for post two, and so on. So this is literally the array we return from this function. This tells Next.js that we want to pre-render all these different post IDs, which will then be put into these URLs. The data for the page will be fetched, and then the HTML will be cached so we can open it much faster. So let's save this and let's build our project again. Again npm run build. And as you can see now we don't have this lambda icon here anymore, now we have this filled circle. Which means that this page is also pre-rendered and statically cached but by using our generate static params. Here they say get static props, this was from the old pages directory, but in the app router we use generate static params instead. The important part is that we now see this circle here. And when we now start our app again, our blog post should load instantly, just like our front page. So no matter which post I click, boom, it opens instantly. Because again, all the data is fetched at compile time, 
and then we just get served the static HTML. This is especially useful for something like a block because it's usually enough to fetch this data at compile time and it's really great for SEO because page loading speed is an important ranking factor. And Next.js makes it possible to open your pages pretty much instantly. To see another example of this, let's take a look at my blog again. I do the exact same thing here. Boom, the page opens instantly. Now the images still need a moment to load, but that's fine because they are lazy loaded anyway. But the blog post itself, all the text is there instantly. There's virtually zero loading time, which is really amazing. Now, one more thing I want to mention here. Sometimes you have a lot of pages, like hundreds or thousands. For example, on an e-commerce website where you have thousands of different products and you might want to have them statically cached, but you can't render all of them at compile time because maybe you don't want to fetch the data for thousands of products because that would overload your server. Now, the cool thing is when you implement generate static params and we open a blog post with an ID that we did not return from this function, the page will then be rendered when a user opens it for the first time. So we still have our one second delay the first time this page is opened. But then Next.js will go ahead and cache this page for any user that visits the page after it. But this only happens if you implement generate static params in the first place. If we don't add this, then we will always have our loading time. We only get this fallback behavior if we implement this function and return something here. To see how this works, maybe let's only pre-render five of these pages. I do this by calling slice. And now we basically only put the first five post IDs into this array, right? Let's also increase the loading time just for a moment. But I will revert this later. This is just for presentation. Set this to a six seconds. Then we execute npm run build again, followed by npm run start. And now when I refresh the page, only the first five pages should be pre-rendered and cached. So they should still open instantly and they do. But when I open a post that was not pre-rendered and I want to open it directly via its URL, for example, post 30, which should be the last one, then we have a loading time of about six seconds before this page opens. Because again, we don't return this idea from generate static params anymore, so it's not pre-rendered. But as I explained, as soon as we implement this function, this page will still be cached after it was rendered for the first time. So when we refresh the page, it actually opens instantly. We don't have this six second loading time anymore. Let's try another one, 29. Again, we have a very long loading time in which Next.js fetches the data, renders the page, but then caches it. So now if we go back to a third tier, it opens instantly and the same for 29. So only one user has to wait until the data is fetched and every user afterwards gets this very fast instant page loading speed. This way you don't have to render all your pages in advance, which again is very useful if you have a ton of them, like thousands. Then you can just render the most important ones or the first 100 or whatever and then use this fallback strategy for the other ones. Okay, but I'm gonna reset this delay here and remove the dot slice to render all pages. I'm also gonna start this in development mode again so we can see our latest changes, npm run dev. One more thing, when we open a page with an ID that doesn't exist, at the moment we get an empty page which is not great for user experience because it's confusing. To change this, we go down here into our component function. And since we make a fetch request, we can check the result of this request. We can check if the status of the response is equal to 404, because this is what the dummy JSON API gives us back if this post wasn't found. If you use something like Prisma, for example, then you can also check that your array that you get back is empty. We just want to know that we didn't receive any data here. Then we want to call not found 
which is an import from next slash navigation. And this will take care that we get redirected to the not found page, which I already included in the starting code. Again, I cover this in my Next.js beginner tutorial. This file has to be called not-found.tsx. And this is where this not found function will redirect us to if this data for this page can't be found. And if we insert a URL for which we don't have a route, we get redirected to the same not found page. You want to make sure that you redirect the users to the not found page properly because if we render an empty page then this would be a pretty bad signal to search engine crawlers because they don't find any data and they will probably think that our website is useless. Instead we always want to give the search engine crawler the correct signals. If we didn't find some data we have to tell it. And this not found page also has the appropriate headers and status codes to give the correct information to the search engine crawler. So the crawler knows exactly what's up. Next, I want to talk a little bit about server components versus client components. I explain what server and client components are in my Next.js beginner tutorial, but they also have implications for SEO. Generally, you want to fetch as much data as possible inside server components. This is what we are doing here. We don't have to use client directive at the top. This is a server component. This is why we can fetch data directly inside the component. And down here we render it. And this is great because this way all the JavaScript and all the packages we need to render these pages will not be shipped to the client. They will only be used on the server to render the page and then the finished HTML will be sent to the client. Now in this example, we don't use any packages to render our pages because they are so simple. But for example, we could have a markdown formatter in here as a third party package. But by using this markdown renderer in the server component, we don't need to send the JavaScript of this package to the client. We only send the finished HTML, the finished markdown. But server components don't support any JavaScript features. We can't do any interactive things on this page, at least not anything that requires JavaScript. For example, button on click listeners don't work in server components. For this we need a client component. But the trick is to make the client components as small as possible. So let's say for example we want to put a button here on this page that we can click to clap for this post like on medium.com which is similar to liking a post just as an example here. Now instead of wrapping this whole page into a client component so that we can use our button in here we can instead just wrap the button itself into a client component and put it into the server component. For this I have prepared this clap button in the starting code, which contains the button and the JavaScript logic and also the state. And again, state can only be put into client components, not into server components. But by putting the use client directive directly here into this button component, we can put it just like this into our server component without having to make this whole page a client component. It's enough if the interactive part is a client component. And this is much better because then all of this stuff here is still rendered completely server side. And when we look over here, so this part is rendered on the server and our clap button down here is rendered on the client. This is why it supports JavaScript features. Okay, cool. And next we will learn how to set up a dynamic sitemap and a robots.txt file, which are also important for SEO. The sitemap is a special file with which you can tell search engine crawlers about the different pages of your website that you want to have indexed in Google or any of the other search engines like Bing. They all read from the sitemap. Now having such a sitemap is not mandatory. These crawlers can also just crawl through all your links and find your pages this way. But this way you make sure that the crawlers don't miss anything. And it's especially important if you have pages where you don't have any links to these pages on your website because then crawlers can't find them at all unless you have such a sitemap. Long story short, it's a good idea to always have a sitemap on your website if you care about SEO. In Next.js there are two different ways to create such a sitemap. We could create a sitemap.tsx file and write the sitemap in here directly. This is the syntax of these sitemaps. It has this URL set and these different URL tags. It's an XML file. But usually you want to generate a sitemap dynamically because 
we don't want to put every single page in here by hand, right? If we have many different blog posts, then we want to just fetch these blog posts and generate these different entries automatically. And we can do this with a dynamic sitemap. For this, we create a sitemap.tsx file in our app folder. So let's do this. Let's go into our project, right click on the app folder, and here we put a sitemap.ts file. Not TSX because we don't put any layout in here and the name has to be exact. Again, otherwise this will not work. Sitemap.ts in our lowercase. In here we export a default async function, which again we call sitemap in our lowercase. It's an async function because we want to fetch our blog posts in here. And again, to get proper autocomplete, we set the return type to a promise of type metadata route, which is coming from next dot sitemap. This is the return type. And in the end, we want to return an array with all our different pages. And for each page, we add a JavaScript object and now we get autocomplete in here. These three values here are optional. The one we have to put in here is the URL of the page. For example, let's say we want to index the about page. Then we can put this URL in here. And it has to be the full URL. We can't just write slash about. This is not enough. It has to be the full URL. So we need the base URL in front of it. And I put the base URL into the .env file, which is part of the starting code. Next public base URL. So here I want to put process.env.nextPublicBaseUL slash about. This is our first sitemap entry. And when we save this, we can already open our sitemap. Make sure your app is running in development mode. So we see the latest changes. Sitemap.t, no, .xml actually. That's the file type. And there it is. That's the first URL in our sitemap. But as I explained, I also want to add entries for every blog post, but I don't want to add them manually. Instead, we want to fetch these blog posts and then just map them into this array. Again, we want to fetch all blog posts, so we copy our fetch request from the front page. In here, import this type. And then we want to map these posts into the same URL structure down here. So let's create a const post entries and I give this the same type metadata route.sitemap because it will also be such an array. And this way we get better auto completion and type safety. And we create this from posts.map. Again, two pairs of parentheses and a pair of curly braces to destructure the ID as we did before. Parentheses, curly braces, because from this we want to return an object. And in here we now get autocomplete, because we set this type here. Again, only the URL is mandatory. Again, we want to start with the base URL and then dot slash. And our blog posts are under slash posts slash and then the ID of the post. If we know the last time we updated a blog post, it also makes sense to set the last modified value. This tells the crawler when you last updated the page, so it can crawl it again. But if you set a wrong value here, like setting all pages just to the latest date, for example, Google will actually ignore this value completely. So it has to be correct. Now we don't have an updated timestamp in our blog post, but let's say we had one, then we would turn this into a date because usually uh, the timestamp is stored in form of a string, for example, post.updated at, and the last modified value expects a date, so we uh, turn this into a date object. But again, we don't have this value here, so I comment this out and just leave it here as a reminder. And we could also set a change frequency for which you have these different options, how often you change this page, I don't set anything here. Again, I just leave this as a comment, as a reminder. And we could also set a priority here, which I think has to be a number 
Yeah, and this defines how important this page is compared to the other ones. I've never used this value anywhere. I usually just use the URL and maybe the last modified timestamp. But if you want to implement these as well, you can do it in here. And then we want to put these post entries into our array down here. So we can just spread them directly into it like this. Let's also put the last modified timestamp in here just to see how this looks in the generated sitemap. I'm just going to set this to the latest date. But again, if you actually use the latest date for these timestamps for all your pages, then Google will just ignore them because Google is smart enough to notice that this is not the correct value. Nevertheless, let's save this, refresh our sitemap, and now we have our dynamically generated blog posts in here, all of them. And we don't have to add them one by one. And later I will show you how to upload this sitemap to the Google Search Console. So make sure to watch this tutorial all the way to the end. Next I want to set up the robots.txt file. With this file you can tell search engine crawlers which pages to ignore, because sometimes you don't want certain pages indexed. Again we can uh, hard code it in static form by just putting a robots.txt file into the app folder or use robots.ts to uh, generate it dynamically. And even if we don't fetch any data here, I actually like this syntax more. So let's create a robots.ts file in our app folder. So again, right click on app, robots.ts, and again, the naming has to be exact. From here, we export a default function called robots, again in our lowercase, and we return metadata route dot robots. We don't wrap it into a promise this time because I don't want to fetch any data here, but you could if you want. And from here we return an object. And in here we can set rules, host and sitemap. Let's start with the rules, which is an array. An array of objects. And again, we get autocomplete here. With user agents, we specify which crawlers we want to target. If we want to target all crawlers, then we put an asterisk in here in form of a string. You can also be more specific and for example, only exclude Google crawlers from certain pages. But here, let's say we want to exclude certain pages from all crawlers. We start by allowing all pages with just a slash like this. Because we want most of our pages indexed, we just want to exclude a few of them, which we can do with this allow, which gets an array. And let's say we want to exclude slash admin, so this doesn't show up in Google. And let's say slash privacy, for example. We still want these pages on our website and users can still open them. We just want them to not show up in Google. And after the rules, we can also set the sitemap, the location of the sitemap, which again is process.env. Let me copy the name. Next public base URL slash sitemap.xml, right? This is where the crawler can find the sitemap. To be honest, I don't really know what the point of this is. We can also submit our sitemap later without this robots.txt file. But I assume that this just helps the crawler find the sitemap if we don't submit it ourselves. This is what I would guess. Anyway, let's save this. And then we should find it under slash robots.txt. And there it is. Let's also put a slash in front of privacy to keep it consistent. I think it actually doesn't matter if you put a slash in here or not, but this way it's more explicit. So such a robots.txt file is not mandatory, but if you want to block pages from search engine crawlers completely, then you need one. So again, we say, okay, listen, all crawlers, you are allowed to crawl all pages, except for the admin and the privacy page. And this is where you can find the sitemap. You could also make this function async, wrap the return type into a promise and fetch data in here if you want to generate these entries dynamically, but here we don't need it. Now when we go to the metadata of a specific page, let's go to the privacy page. We also have this robots field in here, 
This is very similar, but it gives you more fine-grained control for a specific page. So right now the privacy page is completely excluded from crawling. This means that unless we remove this string here, whatever we put in here doesn't really matter because the crawler doesn't even get to the page. But I still want to show you the different options you have in here. Again, we can use autocomplete. For example, we could set index to false and follow to true. If we removed this string here, we would still allow the crawler to crawl this page. But with index false, we say we don't want this page to show up in Google. But with follow true, we allow the crawler to still follow links on this page. So if we had any links on our privacy page, which we have because the header is a link and we also have, for example, the about page here, then the crawler is still allowed to follow these links and index these pages. So you have all this fine control with this robots value here. And you can learn more about this by just Googling for robots meta tag. There you can see all the different options you have here. But again, as long as we disallow crawling for this page altogether, then this stuff here doesn't really matter because the crawler doesn't even get to this point. I still want to leave it here as a reminder. If you care about SEO, it's a good idea to connect your project to the Google Search Console because here you can monitor your Google traffic, you see how many clicks you're getting and if there's something wrong with a page, then Google will tell you about it. You can also see what people have been searching for. Now this is a new website where I don't have any blog posts on, but I can see that people have been searching for smart diary and these different variations, my name and so on. So you have all this data in here, it's pretty useful and it's also free to use. So just go to search.google.com slash search minus console or type Google Search Console into Google and you will get here. And to add a new website, you can click up here and then on add property and here you have to insert the URL. But without the HTTPS, without the WW and any trailing slashes, just like this, myawesomeblog.com as an example. Then we click on continue and then you have to verify that you actually own this website. The way this works is that you have to copy this value here. Then you have to go to the provider where you bought your domain. This could be Verzell, but for a smart diary, for example, I used Namecheap. And here you have to find the DNS settings. You have to check the documentation of your domain provider to see how to get there. On Namecheap, we do this via the advanced DNS settings here. And we want to find something that looks like this with these different records inside it. And then you have to add a new record of type txt. For the host, you just type in an add and then you paste the value we just copied from the console. Then you create this record. I don't do this here because this is not the actual domain. And after you edit this record, you click on verify, then it will check if it can find the record. And if yes, Google knows that you actually own this website because you have access to the DNS settings. And after this is done, your website will show up here in this list. And then you can start monitoring the data. Now it usually takes like two days or so until the data shows up but then it will update daily and you can see your search performance. And the Google Search Console is also where you should submit your sitemap. So here in the sidebar somewhere, you have this sitemaps menu option and here you paste the URL of your sitemap. So it's your website's URL slash sitemap.xml. You submit it and then Google will automatically check it again from time to time. Now it will take a few days until your pages start showing up in Google. In order to check which pages are already indexed, you can type this into the Google search, but with your own URL. Site colon, in this case it's smartdiary.co. In this way we find all the pages of Smart Diary. In this case it's just the front page and the sign-in page because I don't have any other pages. But if you have a blog for example, and these blog posts are indexed, then you should see these pages here as well. And there's actually a trick to get your pages indexed faster. You can submit them manually via this inspect URL field up here. You have to do this for each page by hand. 
So you can't just pass a large list to it. That's the downside. You can also only do it for like 10 or 12 pages per day. But from my experience, this indexes these pages much faster. You will insert the URL, you press enter. And then if the page is already in Google, you see this check mark, which means the page is already indexed, then you don't have to do anything. If the page is not indexed yet, then you can click on request indexing. And you can do this for any sub URL. For example, let's say if I had a blog post blah blah, then I could index this page via this input field. And then usually it's indexed within a single day. Just as a little tip, if you are in a hurry, and if you host your project on Verzel and you have the Verzel Pro plan, which costs 20 bucks per month, then you can also use Verzel Analytics for free, which is a simpler and easier to add alternative to a Google Analytics. As you can see, it's also privacy friendly, which Google Analytics is not. And to activate it, go to your project, open the Analytics tab, click on Next. In the pro plan, it's included until we hit a certain threshold. And then you click on enable and then you get some very simple instructions for some code you have to add to your project. I don't want to go through these steps here because it's very simple. Just follow these instructions. And then you can see in real time who visits your website, at what time, what pages and so on. It's really powerful if you want to monitor the traffic to your website. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on SEO in Next.js. One more thing, I recently created this free React best practices mini course for my email newsletter. You can get it for free under codingandflow.com slash react best practices. I will also put a link to this into the video description. Here you can join my email newsletter and then you get this free email course where you get one email with one small video lesson for a couple of days. And you also join my newsletter, which I highly recommend because I send regular coding tips with new stuff I learned to it. It's of course free and you can unsubscribe at any time. So check it out. Leave a like on this video if you haven't yet. Subscribe to the channel for more Next.js and WebDev tutorials. And then we see us in the next video. Video. Happy coding. Take care.